Great. So, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining another Foreman community demo. I'm a farm active developer within the Foreman project, and I'll be hosting the demo today. Uh, yeah, I guess we can start. We can get started. Uh, for any questions or comments, uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, at the Foreman group chat on metrics, or during the demo, you can also use the chat here on Google Meet. And of course, we're always available in the community. Okay, this is our agenda for today. I moved my topic to be the last one. Um, yeah, I guess we can start. First demo will be by Quirin. Uh, yeah. He's here? Yeah, okay, I see you. Yeah. And great. I, I didn't <laughs> realize I was first, but uh, <laughs> let me try and find the screen share. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I had to delete one demo, and I wanted to to go last. If that's okay with you, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. Um. So. Uh. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, I think you can. <laughs> um. So I want to talk about this feature I'm working on, which is structured apt repositories for Debian content within Catello. Um, and I thought I'd basically go and show how it works up until now and then how it works with the new feature. So I'm just going to go over here. This is a official Debian mirror. And uh, so it's an apt repository that you might want to synchronize into Catello, and if you check this dist folder, it has various little distributions all within the one repositories, and we're going to be looking at Bookworm, which then has a number of subcomponents. So unlike most other content types, apt repos have significant structure that, yeah, or in subdivisions within a repository. And so the way that works right now, so this is a, uh, form an instance that does not have the new feature enabled. This is how it works right now. Uh, I created here a product community demo with a repository, uh, Debian Bookworm, and it uses this mirror I just showed you, and it says we're going to be synchronizing Bookworm, and we're going to be synchronizing only the non-free firmware and contrib components because I didn't want to synchronize 60,000 packages. Um, and I've already synchronized it, so it has 300-something packages in it now. And we can look at how this looks within Catello. And I just need to change the link here because there's some mistake in my development environment in the host name. But yeah, so we can see here we've synchronized this repository we have the disks and the pool folder that we also saw in the upstream repository and if we enter the disks we have bookworm and it has contrib and non-free firmware in it but we also have this other one called default which has just all in it and basically the reason for that is we add that only within catello it doesn't exist in the upstream repository and the reason we do this is because the registered hosts have no way of knowing what distributions and components some repository has in them. So basically, they always use just this default all component, and the default all component contains all the packages in this repository, regardless of how they were structured into different distributions in the and components in the upstream repository. So basically, we're flattening down this upstream structure with the two components into a single component named default all, and using that. And there's, well, several problems with this. So first of all, it just isn't very intuitive for user. It creates user confusion because users know what upstream repositories are structured like. They don't have any idea what this default all is for and why it exists. They also don't know that the upstream structure that we did also synchronize here isn't actually used on a registered host. Um, 
And then the other disadvantage is just the performance overhead from publishing basically all the metadata twice, once in the upstream structure and once in default all. Um, and then there are some host side features like upt pinning that attach to the upstream repository structure and just won't work with this default all construct. So that's how it worked so far. Now I want to go over and here with the new feature enabled, I have the same repository. I've already synchronized it. So it's again, bookworm non-free framework contrib. And if we open it here, we can see that here we only have bookworm. We no longer have the default all. And I've added this repository to a content view, which is called community demo. It's in there. And I've created an activation key for it. Yeah, also called community demo. And now I have here a host prepared that I'm going to register with this activation key using subscription manager. Uh, it should be fairly quick. And then we can check sources list the configured repository, and we see that it has the suites bookworm and components non-free firmware and contrib configured. And in the past, this would always have defaulted to default all. So that's really what's new about the feature. And what made the implementation really difficult is I'm now going to go back to the repository. And I'm going to decide as the user, I no longer want contrib. I just want the non-free component. And I'm going to resync this. It should be fairly quick. Um, so if we go back to the repository and check we see it now no longer has the, the contrib component in it and if we now uh, create a new uh, content view version and promote it to our environment next uh -huh. Hopefully that also goes relatively quickly. Yeah, it's done. And if we now do subscription manager repos to update our configuration on the registered host, and we check the repo file again, we now no longer have it configured here. And so basically this ability to have different sets of, well, it's called suites here, it's also called distributions or releases, terminology is hard, uh, and components, and communicating that to the hosts and for different content view versions can potentially have different sets of distributions and components configured for them. Yeah, that was what caused the complexity in the implementation. So if we go over to the pull request and maybe exclude the test fixtures, there's quite a few changes to enable this. Yeah. And that's all there is to it. I don't know if we have time for questions or if we just go to the next topic. Of course, we have time for questions, but so far, none. Um, yeah, all clear. Yeah, Ian, please go ahead. Hey, yeah, thanks for the demo there, Quirin. Um, so, I was just kind of curious, have you, I'm always just thinking about some of the corner cases from, uh, you know, this new feature with, with all the content finagling you have to do. Um, have you tested anything like, uh, I don't know, like import export, I think? Import export for Debian was enabled a while back, or maybe it wasn't implemented yet, but I was kind of curious if, if that had any, uh, I don't know, meshing issues with this uh with the changes here so i've not tested import export i have tested a lot of weird corner cases so there's things like 
empty Debian repositories, obviously composite content views, composite content views with merge repositories because you added two constituent content views that contain the same repository in different version. Uh, so there's a few cases I have tested, but yeah, I've not yet tested import export. I do have it on a list of things that we will want to retest. That sounds good. And we, we can help with that as we're uh, reviewing your pull request. But yeah, the composites with the merging, that's a great one to test. That's quite a corner case. <laughs> good to hear that works. And yeah, I tested smart proxy sync. That works as well. Awesome. I did. I have a list of things I tested and a few things I know I have not yet tested. Cool. Sounds good. OK, then thanks for the time. And if there are no more questions, I guess we'll move to the next person. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Next one is Ian. Um, Sharing my tab. Yeah, next one is Ian with container push repository content view support. Awesome. Thanks, Nafar. Get my screen shared. Alrighty. Um, so this feature is another <clears throat> important step for our container push feature that we're developing. Um, this marks the majority of the rest of the work to actually make this feature useful. In fact, um, after this is merged, if anyone wants to give it a try, I'd highly recommend trying it out on our Catello Nightly, or it already is merged, actually. Um, but the next time Nightly builds, it should contain these changes. Uh, you just have to update a setting in the Catello YAML file um, to make it enabled, but we'll be turning that off soon for uh, the Catello 414 release. But anyway, um, so in the previous demo, we showed that you're able to push content, uh, push container content via Podman. So I'll just remind you really quick what that looks like. So if I do a, uh, let's see, a Podman image LS, we can see some of the images that I've downloaded here. Looks a bit messy. Um, let's try, let's see, here we go. We'll try this one out, Ariana. So I just need to grab the, uh, uh, the SHA value here, and then we'll do a podman push. My Catello instance. So we're going to paste this one in. And for a reminder, we have a bit of a special scenario here for how to actually push the content. We expect that you namespace it by organization and then um, your product and the name of the container repository. And then after that, you include your tag. So I'll call this, I already have some Ariana's. So I'll say Ariana 3. And then it's the latest tag. If you don't include latest, it's included by default by Podman. And so we'll push this up, and it creates a new repository in Pulp. You can actually see this. Um, now I'll have a bunch, so it might be hard to see. But you can use a listing command, uh, pulp container repository dash dash type, not container, but type push list. And then we can see the varying repositories that I've pushed. I think the new one might be at the top. Yes, here it is. So we can see that Pulp has created a push type repository. Now, for content view publishing, um, there's these push repositories. Pulp have to follow some special rules. One of those rules is you cannot redistrib redistribute them. Um, another rule is that you can't roll them back. Uh, so you can't use different um, repository versions. And so those are two things that are very fundamental to content views in Catello. So in order for us to actually get this to work, what we need to do is we have to copy all of our contents while we're publishing the content views um, to a new repository. And we actually already have this, work play, this uh, workflow set. 
Um, it's the same workflow that's used when you do filtering uh, in Catello. So if you're not using filtering, we can just reuse repository versions in Pulp to copy the content, so to speak. We're not actually copying it. We're just redistributing another uh, repository version. But in this case, for these container push repos, um, we are pushing this content or copying this content completely so we can uh, give the contents a different path. So let me just show you what this looks like. Um, so if I go to show repositories, we see this new Ariana repo I've added. So we'll add this, reload. The UI did not want me to add this. Go. Add the repo. And then we will publish a new version, and I'll promote it to one of my lifecycle environments besides library. And so once this is published, we can take a look at the contents. Now, this takes a little bit longer than your ordinary content you publish because it is actually copying contents under the hood. So we can see that our content was indexed here. We have one tag, one manifest. Um, so let's, uh, let's pop into the console. Firstly, we should make sure we can actually see the content. So if we do a uh, Podman search, let's see. I don't have this in my history. Let's do a Podman search hostname slash and we can see some of these repos. So this Ariana 3 repository that I previously previously pushed is distributed at the library container push review endpoint. Um, we also have the actual library instance here. Um, over here, we have the one that's in my precipitation lifecycle environment. And, and yeah, this one on the bottom was library lifecycle environment. So we could pull from that if we wanted to. Um, now, just to show what Pulp did, um, we can do another Pulp repository list. But this time, instead of type push, we'll do type container. And if I scroll to the top, if I'm lucky, it's the top one. All right, great. So we can see this Ariana 3 repository was created. And let's see, just for fun, we can search this. This is the version href that it represents. And we can see the content. We can see it has two blobs, a manifest, and a tag, which would be latest. And so with this, you're able to use these like any other container repository. Uh, you can filter it. You can sync it to content views, anything like that uh, that you need to do. Um, and with that, there is really only one thing that's still in development on Container Push. And that's if you click into some of these repositories, currently you can edit all this stuff. And um, users should not be able to do that because download policy, that doesn't make sense for push repositories, mirroring policy. You shouldn't be able to change the name because that is set purely through Podman. So once that is done, this feature will be complete, and we will remove the setting so that users can use it freely without worrying about doing strange things to their environments. And I believe that is it. Is, are there any questions? And no questions yet. Let's give people one more second. OK, I guess everything was clear. Yeah, thank you, Ian. I um, guess we can move on to our next presentation, uh, which will be by Partha. Uh, Bulk Terra Management on New or Host Stage. OK, yeah, happy Thursday, everyone. Uh, yeah. Share my screen again. All right. This is... Are you guys able to see my browser? My 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Foreman. Foreman, thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I think the last sprint, last demo, last community demo, Jeremy demoed the packages wizard. Is it the last one or the one before? I don't remember, but one of them. And so era, we can we are using the same ideas for Irada. So I'll, I'll show you a small example of how this works, and then we can kind of play with it. I just wanted to show you. I have. A, I I got some fake errata here. It's, it's, sorry, yeah, I don't have time to sync. Uh, so I, if I did, let me see. Basically, it's a, it's an older version of this package. There, uh, and if I actually go to this page itself, the rel seven places. You can see it has a bunch of security errata that you can install and each of them installs an upgradable package up so i so i'm just showing you a host with some install, installable errata in it just to uh, then do the demo all right so go to the new host page now uh And then yeah, I have, I have a bunch of hosts. I was testing pagination, so I created like a bunch of dummy hosts. Uh, but this one is like rel seven. This one is a legit one. Uh, so I I selected two hosts, and you will. Am I? Oh, I'm. I think I'm still in the old page. Am I? I am. Okay. Hold on. Yeah, new host. That's the one. Sorry, I forgot to. I changed the settings, but forgot to go there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Just in, uh, I can just quickly show you that also. That's it. So we, if you go to admin uh, settings. You see this show show a new host page and you can select that basically if you select select this a new host page will show up uh, so if you select this if you then came to all you, you will get our updated um, updated hosts So here, I selected two hosts. I say, hey, you see a bunch of different options now. You have delete. I, Jeremy showed manage packages, change content environments before. Uh, you can do change content source and and build management. Uh, so today we'll be doing the manage errata. This is the new addition. So uh, okay. That better, yeah. Okay. So this will open up the Irada wizard, uh, and there's the, like I have like fifty one Irada. Like some of this is like all Irada that are that's available for all hosts. So it's pretty much every Irada that's there in in Catello that's is going to show up in this list. If you want to limit it further, you you might want to say you you can search on. Things like you know, find me all the errata where, <coughs> which is, find me all the non-modular errata. For example, I, I used that before. So if I say modular equals false, now it used. I don't know if you noticed, but this was fifty-one before, and now it's forty-four. So it's it's filtered it further. Uh, these are all. These all don't involve module streams. So. It's a good thing. Uh, so we can we can apply that. Uh, I'm just going to select one of them. I'm just going to say select the armadillo one. And hold on, yeah. And hit next. I can yeah. Then I since I chose two hosts, it shows the two hosts here. Uh, I can I can optionally unselect if I wanted, but I'll keep it there for now. 
yeah. And then go to max. So yeah, it, it, it then highlights the one error that it needs to apply. And the host, it needs to get applied to. And you can say apply in. It's that that would that would create a new task and yeah. While the task is going on, I wanted to show a couple of other extra things that this does. We also added the option to do a select also. What happens is it's only RADA available to particular hosts. Uh, I guess I'll go and check that later, but uh, only RADA available to particular hosts. Uh, uh, will be will get applied. So, for example, if I had twenty hosts selected here, and then I said apply all errata, it'll when when the template is getting rendered, when the yum install the DNF install errata is happening, it'll it'll try to make sure hey, what are the only possible installable errata for this host, and use that to determine what sh the actual list should be. So, you can say select all and just run run all, and it'll it'll be very smart about. Okay, only these are applicable, so I'm going to try that. Uh, meanwhile, so I have a, yeah. So for example, if I don't know if you can see this, so let me make it bigger. So the install errata job has two things. This one failed because this is a dummy host and none of the errata that I selected uh, is applicable to this. So it, it just, it, you will see an error if you, if there's no errata possible at all to be installed in a host. So this is just a warning saying, hey, I cannot install any errata, so I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, <clears throat> well, this one, it shows the script that it, it shows the script that it ran. Uh, and it says the yum update minimal minimal. So let's see if it applied the errata. So if I did, okay, you see that it applied the new version. If you see it's a two one one, uh, it's just like an installable errata over that. Uh, and if you if you actually go to the host, you should see. Uh, it actually went to the. Let me go back all the hosts again. Sorry, running a cold here. But yeah. Hmm. If I click on that, yeah, see all the security routers have been gotten applied. Uh, if I go to content, there's like no installable router. They won't be applied. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that that pretty much concludes my demo. Uh, I can. I want to see if I can also show you this one. I think I think I missed this one. It's a build management. You can do the bulk host. You can do the build management stuff for bulk host. So you can go to the build management. You can set a re reboot, and it'll uh, it'll set it to a build mode and uh, be make it ready for con make it ready for provisioning. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that, that's pretty much all I had for today. Uh, any questions? Questions? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Okay, so Thank
can't hear you, Nofar. I'm wondering if you wanted me to start presenting. Um, I was not. I'm sorry, I'm like my computer is um, stuck. I think you can get started, Samir. Okay. I was just wondering if the recording gets messed up if the host leaves. But nope, it's still start. going. Awesome. All right. Let me stop it. Uh, which one is this? Is this one. All right. Sorry. Uh, is my screen looking okay? I will assume yes. All right. Uh, so can, can we get slightly larger? Slightly larger. Yeah. Thank you. Try that. Okay. So and let me increase this font as well. So today I wanted to discuss this new setting that we have recently added, which is called calculate content counts on smart proxies automatically. So this is in connection to one feature that we added uh, like in a previous release, which was on the smart proxy page. So let me go to the smart proxies here. It's a bit too enlarged, sorry. So I have a smart proxy here and I have synced some content to this one. So what we have is we show some content counts here, which are synced to this proxy. So this uh, proxy is tied to environment test, and that has CV1 content view available. And through that content view, it has this repository with these count of packages and errors. So what that content view looks like is this. So this version 3 is currently synced to test. And that's where these packages are coming from. So what happens is every time you publish a content view, so for example, this is my task. And with this task, I also promoted it to test. So that triggered a content view uh, sync on the smart proxies. It synced the content to CentOS 9 proxy devil, that's my proxy. And then it runs a task called update content counts, which actually goes to the proxy pulp and fetches what content actually lives on the pulp on the smart proxy. So uh, what we have here is a new setting and you can turn this on and off. So what this does is right now I have this set to default as yes. So let me, remove this filter, for example. Uh, well, actually, let me remove this filter rule, for example. Perfect. And now if I go back to versions, it will show as needs publish. So I can go ahead and publish a new version. I'll promote it to test. Next, finish. All right, let me go back. So I had the automatic update set to yes. And let's see, hopefully this. Okay, so this is done. We refresh this. So, yeah. So this was the publish task, and I had removed all of the filter rules. So this version should have extra packages. And now if I were to go to the proxy, it will show me updated counts. And this happened automatically on a content view promotion to test environment. So what I can do is set this to no. 
And basically, this will stop the automatic content counting on proxies. So this is useful for people with smart proxies, which have some sort of latency. And that can lead to some extraneous tasks. So you see this parent task, sync content view on smart proxies. Depending on how many proxies you have, you'll see similar number of tasks, which are two here. So synchronize and then update content counts. If you have a large number of proxies, you'll see a large number of these tasks pop up. So you can turn one of these tasks off here. So then what you need to do is whenever you need to update the content counts, if those are not being automatically updated, you have a table action here, which triggers that task individually. So this will uh, cause all of the content counts on your proxies to get updated. Uh, I can show you another publish, and that task will not run. But in the interest of time, I will not. OK, any questions? Yeah, no questions. Thank you, Samir. So, thanks so far. Um, Last demo uh, should be presented by Michael Issues. And I'm not sure how it would work. Try to be very screen. Not working. Um, sorry, I'm trying to fix that. And um, if I'm heardable, can someone please just finish the demo? Um, okay, what about now? I think you can hear me, right? Now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, so well, yeah, my screen, I tried and I couldn't compare um, with that. Uh, so I'm sorry. Um, but thank you everyone for joining. And uh, the next demo is as usual uh, in three weeks. It will be in the August 1st. And I hope to see everyone. Thanks, everyone. Nice demos. Thanks, all.